Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're doing part 149 of our Planet Zoo Mod Spotlights where we take a look at some of the wonderful mods people have been making and using to talk about some of the wonderful biodiversity that we share or shared our world with so that's pretty cool so today we've got an exhibit animal and the rest are all pretty much birds or mammals so very, very interesting so we're going to be starting off with the exhibit animal first done by Leaf so this is another kind of not quite reskin, but kind of an animal that we covered before. This is the Black Ed Montella, uh, which is uh, Montella is a species of frog in the family Metellidae. We've covered a couple other species of these guys. Uh, these guys are only found in Madagascar, and uh, well, at least the genus is. And what really makes them interesting as well is they've convergently evolved the ability to have toxins, very much like the poison dart frogs. So uh, if you they eat certain insects and that's where they get their poison from. So if you guys want to eat them or touch them, you got to be very careful because they are poisonous in the wild. But these guys, as I mentioned, only found in Madagascar and their natural habitats are typically like subtropical to tropical moist forests or trump swamps or mountain forests and swamps. So they do like areas that are warm with lots of water because they are amphibians, of course. In terms of their behavior and everything, they're not too different from other Mantella species, as we've mentioned before. But they are threatened by climb, uh, habitat loss, which is really sad. And none of their habitats are actually currently protected as of 2017. So sadly, this species is not in a place where there's not much protected habitat for them. And that means they are considered critically endangered. So part of the reason why they're considered critically endangered as well is because of the pet trade. So they are kept as pets. But um, in the past, they had been collected as large numbers, and the pet trade has been considered a major threat to the species. So hopefully with some captive breeding, there hasn't been a thing much anymore. But uh, illegal collecting and poaching is a very big issue in Madagascar because of all the unique species and that people don't want to keep them, and then they collect them from the wild. And that's, like, you know, of course, another big issue. But yeah, really, really cool. Definitely love these mantellas. That was done by Leaf. Oh, he does a wonderful job. Next up, we are moving uh, to uh, the Andes. We've got the Andean Mot Mot, which was done by uh, Great Cakes Mod, who, of course, is like always dominating the scene at the moment. Really makes so much awesome mods, and especially lots of lovely birds. So the Andean Mot Mot is, or the Highland Mot Mot, or Mot Motus Motus Equalis, like Equator, is a colorful near pastorine bird found in Colombia, Northern Colombia and Western Bolivia. So uh, the Andean Mot Mot and the Blue Cape Mot Mot, uh, there's a lot of different species of Mot Mot that were all considered conspecific, but now they're kind of recognized as their own thing. And then there's two different subspecies of Mot Mot, of the Andean Mot Mot. So uh, the, they don't look too different. They're pretty typical for their family. They are a larger bird with a short, uh, stout black bill and a long tail with a raquette at the end, as you can see there. They get about 46 to 48 centimeters, or about 18 to 19 inches long, and weigh between 143 and 202 grams, or between 5 to 7 ounces. And you can see their, black, uh, their back, wings, throat, breasts, and belly are all kind of this light green. Uh, and the crown you can see is also black, and they've also got these iridescent marks with black spots as well. And the raquettes is also dark blue, so you can see dark blue on their feathers as well, with like a black mask and things like that. So a very, very pretty bird. Definitely really, really cool. So we'll have a look at one of the lights, we probably get a better look at it. Uh, there's a juvenile, so this is one of the cute little babies. You can see real little cutie. We'll get to him when we talk about breeding. Is this in a... That must be the dog. Come on. No, that's a juvenile. There we are, there's the adult. So these guys are resident to the Andes from Colombia through to Ecuador and Peru in northwestern Bolivia. And they've been known to occur in all th uh, three major condellas, uh, corridellas in Colombia. But other places they can only be found on the eastern side of the Andes. These guys typically range between 1500 uh, or 1000 meters to uh, three, uh, 310 meters or up to 10,000 feet in uh, elevation so it depends where they are but there is a little bit of changes when they range in different countries uh, but they generally can be found under a thousand to uh, ten thousand three thousand to ten thousand or four thousand to ten thousand feet kind of above sea level which is quite interesting and these guys pr primarily like those humid montane forests often found near streams as well and can be found along forest edges and in secondary uh, forests too 
So in terms of their anatomy and feeding, these guys are omnivores. They typically feed on arthropods, but also will eat fruit. And they've also been documented taking small uh, possums and the genus uh, Myconerus. So these are kind of the really small uh, neotropical, also called mouse opossums is their other name. So that's really, really interesting. In terms of their babies, let's find the babies again. There we are. Look at these little cuties. Uh, the Indian motmot is assumed to actually nest in a long burrow in an earth bank like other motmots, but there's actually not been a nest described for Indian motmots. But there was a male in breeding condition that was collected in September in Colombia, so believed to be probably around September, October with the breeding season. And the song of the Indian motmot has been described as a monotone bop op, similar to that of the similar species, the Rufus motmot. And luckily, they are considered least concerned, so they are doing quite well. But of course, things like climate change uh, and habitat destruction could affect these guys since they're like mountain forests. They prefer this kind of habitats uh, since, you know, that warm up means that basically they put the habitat is pushed higher and higher up the mountains until they're gone. But still, really, really cool. Love these guys. Another great cakes mod. Uh, I love saying that. Doesn't have to say the great, great cakes mod. It is a great cake mod. Really done awesome. So next up, we've got one done by Monsoon, who's returned again and got a very famous duck. I'm surprised it hasn't been put in earlier, but here we have got the mallard. So you can see a wonderful mallard duck. So the mallard or the wild duck, their scientific name is Anus, which is just Greek for duck, and Platyrhynchus, which means just wide build. So its name's a broad build duck, pretty much. So these guys are a dabbing duck or dabbling duck. Uh, that breeds in the temperate in some tropical uh, Americas, Eurasia, and North Africa, but have been introduced to places like New Zealand, Australia, Peru, Brazil, Uruguay, Chile, Colombia, the Falkland Islands, and South Africa, mainly for hunting, of course. So as I mentioned, they are, uh, they're one of the many birds described richly by Carl Linnaeus, and were given the name Anus uh, platyrhynchus, which means just the broad-billed duck. And the name Rallid actually refers to any wild drake, and is sometimes used in this way, but typically we refer to mallards and things like that. And these guys are actually very interesting as well genetically, and part of the reason why they're so impactful to other uh, species that are more endangered is that they're really good at hybridizing with other species of duck. They've been docu uh, documented hybridizing with more than 40 species of duck in the wild, and then another 20 in captivity. So that means uh, when they go to areas with ducks that are related but much more endangered, they can dilute the gene pool and make the species, like I'll use the Pacific Ray Duck, uh, the Laysons duck from Hawaii, that's a great example, can make them more endangered as it reduces their fitness uh, and like dilutes their gene pool. It was quite interesting. And there are certain mallards that appear to be closer to their endoprotective relatives than their American relatives. So there seems to be very interesting genetics going along there as well. But in terms of their description, these guys are a medium-sized waterfowl that are often slightly heavier than most dabbling ducks. Uh, they're about 50 to 65 centimeters, or about 20 to 26 inches long, which their body makes up about two-thirds, and they have a wingspan of about 81 to 98 centimeters, or 31 to 39 inches, and weigh between 0 0.7 to 1.6 kilograms, or about 1.5 to 3.5 pounds, and, and which is quite cool. So the breeding male mallard is kind of pretty easy to tell apart. You can see they've got that kind of uh, green iridescent head with the black kind of like the nape there you can see it's got the yellow bell with the blue line and then you got of course the uh almost like it's got a collar on and you got the white things and you've also got the curling feathers at the back there so male uh breeding colors are kind of unmistakable they've got their glossy bottle green head and all that and the rear of males you can see it's got dark tail feathers so they're pretty easy to tell apart but ma uh, females as we can go in comparison it's uh all juvenile males sometimes we can see you find a female much more mottled colors, as you can see. A uh, very typical coloration of most dabbling ducks. And have buff cheeks and a dark crown of the eyes. They also have a, you know, a little bit of a blue, brighter uh, feather there, as you can see. It tells them apart. And often, mallards, like other sexually dimorphous ducks, can actually go through spontaneous sex reversal, which often dabbles things like their ovaries, which is quite interesting. And most, most, uh, both male and female mallards, you can see, have that iridescent... Uh, feathers that streamed with white, which is actually prominent in flight at rest, but terribly shared uh, during the annual summer molt. That's one of the ways you can tell them apart. And um, really, really cute. Uh, we'll have a look at them upon hatching as well. We'll talk about the breeding. 
But yeah, there's several ducks that can be confused with female mallards, like mottled ducks, American black ducks, but typically mallards are the same. But in captivity, they can do have kind of like white uh, white plumages and other colors in captivity. They're also quite a noisy species. They're the type of duck that makes that characteristic duck quack uh, that you think of most ducks. They're, they're the ones that make it. It's a mallard duck. But they do have some regional accents as well, which is quite interesting. And they'll often be quite vocal on nests as well, which is quite interesting uh, as well. And um, some actually find that they're a rare example of both Allen's rule and Bergman's rule in birds. So polar forms of these guys tend to be larger than warmer climates. Uh, and as well, they tend to have smaller, uh, smaller appendages as well to minimize heat loss. So they're a great example of those kind of rules. And due to the varied, uh, the genetic code of the mallard, they can interbreed a lot with other species and create a wide range of hybrids, which is really cool. So in terms of their distribution, as I mentioned, they can be found widely across the northern and southern hemisphere. North America quite, uh, pretty much ranges across the Paleoarctic, uh, you know, Alaska and Mexico, the Hawaiian Islands, Iceland and Jordan, uh, Greenland, parts of Morocco as well, as well as like Siberia, Japan and South Korea. And upon the east, it could be found around southwestern and Australia and eastern Australia and New Zealand in the southern hemisphere where they've been introduced. And for example, they do migrate, migrate in some areas, it just depends as well. But these guys are typically uh, live in a wide variety of habitats like fresh and salt water, wetlands, ponds, parks, rivers, estuaries, lakes, and things like that. Water depths of less than three feet are preferred, but they have been seen in waters uh, up to a few meters deep and attracted to bodies of water with lots of vegetation. So, in terms of their feeding, these guys are omnivorous, so they're quite generalized in their diet. So uh, their diet is actually made up by several factors, such as their breeding cycle, variations in like seasons, things like that, and competition with other species or even other mallards. So it just depends. But the majority of their diet seems to be mainly gastropods. So things like insects, uh, like flies, butterflies, beetles, catflies, dragonflies, things like that. Crustaceans, arthropods, worms, and other seeds of plant matter, also roots and tubers. So they do have a wide variety in what they eat. They've also been reported on eating frogs and actually other small, uh, really small migratory birds, such as grey wagtails, which is quite interesting. But now we're going to talk all about their breeding, because these guys, we can have a look at these cute little babies. You can see these baby colours, very characteristic. They've got like a yellowish... Uh, belly with like a dark brown back with a little bit of a mask going on and some spots of the yellow as well looks really really cute so typically they form pairs and from october to november in the northern hemisphere until the female lays eggs uh, at the start of the nesting season which is beginning in spring at this time they are left by the male who joins the other males when the molting period which begins in june in the northern hemisphere and during this brief time however the males are sexually potent and they will either be on standby to like sire replacement crutch, uh, clutches just in case something happens to the clutches that she has or forcibly mate with other females uh, if they need to because these guys are not uh, they don't know what consent is really <laughs> so typically nesting sites are on the ground where the female's hidden uh, appearance is actually quite good camouflage as he incubates but female ballads, mallards have also been known to uh, nest in the hollow of trees balconies roof gardens and places like that typically egg clutches uh, number from 8 to 13 with these creamy uh, bluff eggs uh, with speckles which is quite interesting. They're typically laid on alternate days, and the incubation period begins when the clutch is almost complete. Incubation will typically take between uh, 27 to 28 days, and then they typically will fledge or get their adult coat of feathers at about 60 days. So the ducklings uh, are precocial, so they're pretty much, as soon as they're born, they're well able to swim and, fl and uh, as soon as they hatch. However, in the imprinting compels them to stay instinctively near their mother, not only for warmth and protection, but able to learn how to forage and things like that. And though adoptions have been known to occur, they tend to not tolerate stray ducklings near their broods, and will violently drive away any far uh, unfamiliar young, even killing them. But when uh, these ducklings mature, they typically learn um, and remember the traditional migratory routes uh, from their mothers, unless they are born and raised in captivity. And even New Zealand, where they're naturalized, the uh, nesting seats are so to be longer, egg clutches are larger, and nest survival is actually quite a bit greater than their ranges, so it's a bit bit of a bad issue. Good for the mallards, but not good for us, or well, good for the people that want to hunt them. 
but not good for us because we've mentioned there's some conservation efforts with these guys. But during the breeding season, they can be quite aggressive. They will fight each other and uh, peck at each other and rip, even rip each other's feathers and skin off in rare cages. And they try to fight, fight each other. And this allows them to kind of pick the best partners. And they've been known to carry these out. We're encouraging other ducks to begin fighting. So the female kind of picks the best one out of the fight and then goes mate with them, which is quite interesting. And then the drake often is ends up being left out as I've paired with mating as isolated female ducks and even find some of the different species. But um, they've actually been occasionally targeted as well as brood parasites, so they will take and take care of the eggs of other species. And that can include quite a variety. So that includes redheads, rubby ducks, lesser scalps, gadwalls, shovelers, pintails, teals, and other types of ducks and things like that, and which is quite interesting. But yeah, in terms of predators, uh, you know, humans love to hunt them. That's why they've been introduced to a lot of areas. Uh, they've been uh, often hunted by things like raptors and owls, mustelids, corvids, snakes, uh, raccoons, opossums, turtles, large fish, cats and dogs, uh, all those things, falcons, things like that. And other predators like herons will eat a lot of the babies. So yeah, they're a very common predator prey species for a lot of animals, so quite important in the ecosystem. But luckily they are considered least concern. Uh, since 1988 they've been considered uh, of least concern. That's because they have a large range, it's more than 20 uh, million square kilometers, I think. Yeah, 20 million. And then the population is increasing, rather than decreasing over the 30% of 10 years to make them vulnerable. But the population is very large. And unlike many other waterfowl, they have actually benefited a lot from people. Uh, and they are considered an invasive species in a lot of regions. They actually, people like them, so we want, you know, they want to put them in our parks, you know, have them for bread and everything. And they have been domesticated. Uh, most are not domesticated. They've been so successful with coexisting with humans that they do pose a risk of um, the loss of genetic diversity among ducks that are native. They're also very adaptable, So, and also the Risa Fera ones actually uh, really are an impact of a lot of species. So because they can breed quite well with other species of ducks, uh, animals such as the Hawaiian duck, the New Zealand grey duck, the Pacific blue duck, model ducks, Mexican ducks, and things like that, they hybridize with them, which means they lose some of those adaptations that allow them to live in a specific environment. And that reduces their fitness, which means the species eventually will probably go extinct, which is not, too, which is not a good thing. But um, they pollute the uh, gene pool and it makes the babies less fit to survive in that specific habitat. So that's part of the reason why a lot of people are, mm, we don't want them around here. But they've mainly been introduced to places like New Zealand and Australia because we like to hunt them. But yeah, the people like to hunt them. There's often like duck seasons and everything. People eat them as well. And they've been domesticated for about 4,000 years at least. So yeah, they're important species. And they do taste good. Very nice species. But I just don't want them breeding with our cool native blue uh, grey ducks and things like that. But yeah, really, really cool animal. Definitely a big fan. Nice to see Monsoon putting their hat in the game again for some wonderful mods. So next up, we're going back to New Zealand again. Uh, I love talking about native New Zealand animals. We've got another Great Cakes mod. Uh, they have made a Kia, which I'm so excited to talk about. So we've got a Kia here. Oh, why are you going to do this to me? That's not what I wanted to do. Stop it. There we are. There's the Kia. So the Kia, their Māori name is uh, Kia, of course, but their scientific name is Nestor Nobilis, or Notabilis. These guys are a large family. They're related in the Kirikaka in the uh, Nestoridae. They're typically now found in the forested and alpine regions of the South Island of New Zealand. So in terms of their taxonomy, they're originally named by John Gold in 1856 from two specimens that he found from Walter Mantel. And they told them these birds are about eight years about the birds eight years previously and kind of got their name the word for uh their name in maori is just onopaic so it's basically the sound they make if you heard them you go and it says akia so that's where they get the name from so in the genus they live in is the nectar nobilis uh nesta nobilis is their name but they are related to the kaka which is a more common species around lives the forest in new zealand and there's a couple other species that lived on the chatham islands and norfolk islands and also their other closest relative is the kakapo which is part of the new zealand parrot group which is quite cool so these guys are quite a large parrot they get between 46 and 50 centimeters or about 18 to 20 inches in total length with some getting potentially up to 22 inches or 55 centimeters 
A dot here typically are between 750 to 1,000 grams, or between 1.6 to 2.2 uh, pounds, with males being on average just under, you know, kilogram at 956 grams, or 2.1 pounds, and females averaging about 700 grams, or about 1.7 pounds, which is quite interesting. So in terms of their plumage, you can see they're mostly olive green with a grey beak that has a long, narrow, curved upper beak, which is really good for getting into meat, as we'll get into. They have dark brown irises, and you can see they've got these uh, siri eye rings around them and grey legs. One of the sad things that you can't see in this model, because obviously the wings won't extend, but on their under feathers, they have like very orange uh, feathers on the underside of their wings. And But other than that, you can see they've got that olive green colour to them as well. And which is quite interesting. So they're one of the nine species of parrot that are endemic or only found in New Zealand. And one of the later ones as well, as long as the kaka and the kakapo. Their modern range now kind of encompasses lowland river valleys and coastal forests around the South Island. Up to the alpine regions of the South Island like Arthur's Pass and Mount Cook National Park. Where they live in like southern beach forest. But apart from the occasional vagrant, they're not often found in the uh, North Island. Though there have been some fossil kia that have been found around the Wairarapa, like Hastings and Waitomo, uh, which is in the North Island. It suggests they would have lived a lot through that area uh, up to the time where Polynesian settlers came about 750 years ago. And kia subfossils are actually not restricted to these areas. So even though we like to consider them an alpine parrot, it's very likely just a relict. So they were probably much more common in lowland areas and in the North Island as well before the Polynesian and European settlers came along. So they're most likely more common. And it's believed to be this distribution is because of mammal predators, uh, you know, attacking these guys. And they kind of are able to hide in these mountains just because there's not so many of them up in the mountains, which is quite interesting. And it is really sad as we'll get into. In terms of breeding, there's been at least one report that suggests these guys are polygamous and seen as one male with multiple females, uh, which is interesting. And they're quite social birds. They can live to groups of up to 13. And isolated individuals do badly in captivity, but respond well when seeing themselves in a mirror. So they like having friends. In one study, though, they occurred at a density of 1 per 4.4 square kilometers. But they do like hanging around at the southern beach and actually one of the few species of parrots, as I mentioned, that hang out above the tree line. Their nests are usually positioned on ground underneath large beech trees or rocks, crevices, things like that. And it can be tunneled up to one to six meters down into a larger chamber where they'll like line it with mosses and lichens and things like that. Make it nice warm. And typically the laying period, we'll have a look at the babies as we talk about that. Let's see if we can find the baby. Here we are. Very easy. So these little babies, they typically uh, are laid between July and reaches into January. Two to five white eggs are laid with incubation taking about 21 days and a brooding period of about 94 days. And sadly, uh, the mortality of young Kia is quite high, with less than 40% surviving their first year, with the medium span, lifespan of a wild Kia being about 5 years, that they have been based on the portion seen around Arthur's past. Though the oldest, being parrots, they could live potentially 60-80 years. The oldest recorded captive Kia is about 50 years old, that was in 2008. Though sadly, it's because of a lot of predators and things like that, as we'll get into. So in terms of their diet and feeding, these guys are omnivores. And they feed on more than 40 different plant species. Uh, grasshoppers, beetle larvae, snails, other birds, including shearwater teaks, chicks, and mammals. They've been known to eat sheep, rabbits, and mice, as we get into. They might observe breaking over shearwater nests and uh, eating the marrow as well. They also eat a lot of carcasses. They'll prey on, uh, scavenge the carcasses of tar, things like that. And the Kia also take advantage a lot of human garbage and uh, gifts of food, you can think like that. And they've also been recorded using tool behavior. And a, a captive individual named Bruce, who had a broken upper beak, he wedged the pebbles between his tongue and lower mandible to utilize this to aid with his preening. So that's quite interesting. That shows just how intelligent Kia are. And um, there's been a long controversy of whether these guys actually prey on sheep, and but this is now actually pretty much confirmed. So Kia um, usually, or oh, well, kind of still do, but they're much rarer now, of course. So what they would do is find sheep and then attack their backs, where they'd get the fat around their kidneys. And this was called so much shock to the sheep that the sheep would die. And this is actually part of the reason why they're so endangered, because they, uh, at the time, you know, there was lots of them and farmers were losing their sheep. So they're like, okay, we're going to put a bounty on these guys so they protect our sheep. And sadly, that obviously meant lots of Kia died, which is really sad. Yes, yeah, so we'll talk about their uh, 
relationship humans. They're quite notorious. If anyone that's lived in the South Island or been around Kia knows they're definitely characters. So they've been known to damage a lot of cars and things, you know, pull the rubber off your windshield and things like on oh, your windshield wipers, things like that. And they've been kept as pets before, but they can be seen in captivity. The place I work, we have two captive gear, which is quite cool. And they're quite commonly encountered, especially in Quite Curious, where they've given a cheeky, you know, fun personality. Quite cool, though. But sadly, they are threatened by a lot of um, things. So they paid a, they used to pay a bounty for Kias, you know, to protect livestock. And more than 150,000 Kias were killed before the year 1970, when the bounty was lifted. And one of the big issues as well is lead poisoning, um, but also things such as uh, Kia numbers have been declined because of possums and predators killing their nests. Also, this has led to, within the 1970s, their population is now believed to be about 5,000 birds. But another thing is lead poisoning, because, you know, we got to kill the tar, and we would just leave the uh, bullets in the tar. They just the lead and die from it. Also, 1080 poison, uh, which has been used, pesticides that's used a lot by the Department of Conservation to help uh, Kia survive. You know, they um, do lots of uh, control on introduced mammals. These guys are actually one of the few that still eat the poison and can die from these baiting stations and get injured because mainly as well because of Kia near to people. They're extra curious because they know anything could be food around people. Those kind of Kia affected. Not too bad, but they are still at risk because of the curiosity for 1080 baits as well. But luckily they are doing okay. There's lots of conservation efforts to protect them. They are protected now. Uh, there's been Kia deaths through the traffic and people protecting them. Uh, so now the population has been estimated uh, to be now between 3,000 and 7,000 individuals, so it's probably improved or at least stabilized. They are living in low densities, and hopefully there's efforts, you know, to reintroduce them back into the North Island and help their populations. And mainly once we get these introduced predators under control, I reckon these guys will do a lot better. So yeah, really, really awesome. It did be cool to talk about the Kia. So we'll have a look at the little adult for, the adult for a moment. Oh, no, that's not what we want to click. Everyone just wants to click everything else at the moment. So where are you? That's another juvenile. I want to talk about the adults. So let's have a look at your camera. So there's a wonderful adult there. And yeah, they're always very good climbers. Definitely do love these guys. I love Kia. Such cheeky birds. They're very interesting personalities. Oh, so yeah, that's where we are. Anyway, next up, we've got another great cakes mod. I know I kind of uh, gone out in the world there, but we're going to go back into prehistory, you know, have a look at some wonderful guys here. So here we've got a really interesting animal by great cakes mod. We've got called um, Hoplodomerix. So these guys are a genus of extinct ruminant that are quite deer-like, but we don't know exactly where they fit in the family tree. They actually lived in the former um, Grango Island, like Dendromerix, which is like that big hedgehog thing I covered a few episode ago. Uh, they lived during the Miocene and early Pliocene, which is actually now the Grango Island, which is now a peninsula at the end, east coast of South Italy. They've got the nickname the prong deer because they have these like really uh, five horns that look a lot like prong horns, but they've also got the musk deer like little saber teeth going on there, which is quite interesting. So it's fossilized remains have been retrieved from the late 1960s onwards and found it like a reddish, massive like color of uh, plays and things like that. They're originally thought to be filled Mesozoic livestones, but now be due to like late Pleistocene, early Pliocene as well. So these guys, as I mentioned, were a very deer-like ruminant. They have a pair of prolonged horns you see going on there, around each nose, and then one central nasal horn. And they're actually the only known, uh, they're not the only horned deer before the appearance of antled deer. So some of them had horns before they got antlers. And members of these have been fairly common uh, with horns. Another leftover from this stage is Anello Capra at the stage, which is actually as the only survivor of a relatively successful group. So Otto Capra is, you know, the pronghorn. It has the modern pronghorn, which is quite interesting. And one of the distinctive features as well that kind of tells it apart from other species is they've got one central horn and then a pair of horns on their orbits there, uh, which is really, really interesting. Cool animals as well. So in terms of species, there are a couple different species described. Uh, kind of don't know whether they should be lumped or not. It kind of depends. They uh, form size groups from tiny to huge, with different morphologies being present. So all stain groups have these typical features, but these different size groups are now considered to be chronotypes, potentially like tracking the evolution as they got smaller and smaller uh, as, over time, so they could you know better adapt to uh, island conditions or potentially just different morphologies. So you can say bigger ones have, with more browsers or grazers, things like that, just different morphologies taking up the niches on the island. 
So there's a tiny or small specimens do show insular dwarfism, but the huge specimens could potentially just be uh, taking different niches or um, early relatives that kind of came on the island that just stayed big for whatever reason. There was probably still a lot of back and forth. And at this time, there was lots of coexisting morphotypes that paralleled the Canova cervus, which is another species of uh, deer that lived in the Pleistocene in Greece. And opinions on taxonomy differ. There's been one genus from eight multi-types, or two genera for five species. It's kind of taxonomy being taxonomy. It's kind of hard. And these guys, there's different lip proportions. These guys, very interesting. So this species, I believe, it has Mantelli, is in this one. This is from 1984. Very interesting as well. So the large variation is actually thought to be adaptive radiation, where its Oligocene ancestor would have kind of got on the island, there would have been so many niches open that they could develop all these different morphotypes within that genus. And also the lack of large maternal predators actually limited the food in all these niches and allowed for all these different sizes. So bigger ones could take advantage of different food sources and smaller ones, uh, things like that, which is quite interesting. And the morphology, as I mentioned, is long being contentious, and also their taxonomy as well, where they fit in the uh, bove family or well, the artiodactyl family tree has been a bit controversial, as they're not closely related to really any living ruminant groups, though they have occasionally been considered, they're originally considered uh, members of the cervidae or deer, however analysis of their horn calls show they're probably more relation uh, closer to bovids, so such as antelopes and things. And an affinity has been supported, so they most of it support that they were some relative of bovids, which is quite interesting. But yeah, really, really cool mod. Definitely love this, uh, talking about extinct animals. Definitely a very weird one. So that's the female. Let's see if you can find the male. Where's the male at? There you are. So yeah, very interesting animals. I do like how it's come out. I love talking about these weird extinct beasties. So, next up, we're going to be talking about the ringtail. So, not the ringtail lemur. This is actually a North American animal. This was done by the boy and Genora Pizza. We have got the ringtail. So, this is a mammal from the raccoon family, and it's native to the arid regions of North America. So, you can see they look quite interesting. They've got like a black to dark brown color with pale undersides on their body. They've also got a pointed muzzle with long whiskers similar to a fox, with their like name actually meaning clever little fox, which is quite interesting. Uh, and their body actually resembles a cat a lot. A lot. They've also got this mask, you know, with the dark brown and black surrounding the eye, and also the light around there as well. And they get their name the ring tail because of their long tail that has black and white rings along it with 14 and 16 stripes. Also, you know, quite similar to things such as, you know, the ring tailed lemur. And uh, these guys are primarily nocturnal, so they have large eyes and upright ears that make it easy for them to navigate in the dark. They're quite adept climbers as well, using their long tail to climb on things. And the white rings actually... Uh, I mean, the tail actually acts as distractions, so it can be a target, and then they can kind of increase their chance of escaping. They also got small straight claws, and they're semi-retractable that allow them to climb quite well. And smaller than house cats, they're actually one of the smallest ex uh, extant procyonids, only the smallest in the Argola species. It was an average smallest, so they're quite small. Their body gets between 30 to 42 centimeters, or 12 to 17 inches, with the tail averaging about 31 to 44 centimeters, or 12 to 17 inches at the base, and then typically weigh between 0 0.7 to 1.5 kilograms. Very interesting as well, they've got a flexible ankle joint that makes them a very good climber. Also got that long tail that helps them balance when they're climbing, which is quite interesting. And in terms of uh, adults, they tend to live solitary lives and really only coming together to mate. And they have a typical call of quite a very loud planet of bark, but they have been known to produce a variety of sounds very much like raccoons uh, and chatters, things like that. So in terms of their... Uh, um, also behavior they've been also has also been using fecal marketing behavior as a form of intra-pacific communication to defend territories and also attract mates it's also been it has been suggested that they use feces as a way to mark territory as they defecate in similar areas in a non-random pattern so that means they use those basically their poo to mark their territories as i mentioned they also prefer a solitary existence but they may actually share a den and sometimes groom each other these uh, exhibit limited interactions except during the breeding season which occurs in early summer and they can survive for long periods on uh, of survive for long periods on water derived from food alone as they have a urate which is more concentrated than any other mammal 
So they are such well adapted, you know, for maintaining water. They don't need it so much. They can get a lot from their food. So they don't need to worry so much about finding standing water, which is quite interesting. So now we're going to have a look at the cute little babies here. So these little ringtail babies. So typically ringtails will mate in the spring. And their uh, gestation period is about 45 to 50 days, which the male, uh, the mate, um, which then they mate, and then they'll procure food for the female. Uh, the male kind of gets food for the female, that's the best way to describe it. There'll be usually two to four kits within a litter, and uh, the cubs will open their eyes after about a month, and will hunt for themselves after four months. Then they reach sexual maturity at about 10 months, and their lifespan in the wild is typically about seven years, which is not too bad, considering. So we'll talk a little bit about their threats and things like that in habitats. So they are considered least concerned, so they're doing all right. Um... Typical range and habitat is like rocky deserts, uh, where they're found uh, the, the, the Great Basin Deserts, around like the Sonoran Desert and the Chihuahuan Desert as well in New Mexico. And in areas with lots of water, there can be as many of uh, the deep ringtails found, and depending on that, but they've been found in like Oregon, California, Kansas, New Colorado, Louisiana, Texas, pretty much all those kind of places, which is quite interesting. In terms of their diet, though, these guys uh, eat a lot of small vertebrates, such as passerine birds, rats, mice, squirrels, uh, rabbits, snakes, lizards, toads, and things like that. However, they are omnivorous and will feed on berries and insects all year round, uh, that they prefer, you know, they might make foods. But as omnivores, uh, they eat a variety of food, which is animal matter makes up most of their diet. With insects and small mammals being most of their diet, uh, though they um, occasionally will find fish, lizards, birds, and carrion. They also eat juniper berries, things like that. And results of scat show that these guys prey on whatever is most abundant in the region. So if there's lots of rabbits in a region or lots of insects in a region, they'll just eat what they can find pretty much. They're not too worried about too much things, which is quite interesting. But these guys are not the top of the food chain, unfortunately. Uh, these guys get preyed upon by foxes, coyotes, raccoons, bobcats, and uh, owls and hawks will prey on uh, ringtails of all ages, though mostly young, more vulnerable ones. And also, um, although occasionally prey to coatis, uh, lynx, and mountain lions, they are rather adept at actually avoiding predators. The ringtail is success is determining potential prey is largely attributed by their ability to actually secrete uh, musk when started or threatened. Though their main predators are birds such as the red-tailed hawk and the great horned owl. And they originally occasionally hunted for their pelts, but their pelts are not especially valuable. And fur trapping has slowed down considerably. But their current population trends and rates is unclear, but they are still considered least concerned, considered relatively common. And they have been considered to be easily tamed or habituated to humans. And can make actually uh, affectionate pets and actually quite good mouses for going and grabbing mice. And actually miners and settlers used to keep uh, pet ringtails uh, to keep their cabin free of vermin. Hits, they've been often called the miners cat, there's a lot of miners had them to get rid of vermin. So yeah, really, really cool animals. If they do love a uh, nice ringtail, cool animal to show off. It's not an animal that we see often. And Gaboy always does a wonderful job. Gaboy is really awesome mod. It always does some really amazing mods. So yeah, really, really awesome. Definitely love these guys. So last but certainly not least, we've got by Leaf and Nuto. We have got our uh, Smilodon Populatar. So uh, I've covered Smilodon a few times. And I covered uh, Smilodon Fatalis, I believe, once. But now we're going to cover Populatar. So in the genus Smilodon, there are three different species of uh, Smilodon. There's uh, the American one that was, there's the, well, the earliest one is Crocillus that evolved into the North American, South American species. So Fatalis was the North American one. That's the one you find in the Brea tar pits. But the South American one was popular tar, which is quite interesting. So what happened with popular tar, the largest species... Uh, these guys got quite big. They were among the largest species of felids, with body masses ranging from 220 kilograms or 490 pounds to over 400 kilograms or 890 pounds. And even one estimate suggesting they would have been over potentially over a thousand pounds or 470 kilograms. So they would have got quite big. Had a shoulder height of 1.20 centimeters or 4.7 inches. They were much more robust than their northern relatives, and more elongated, narrow skull and things like that. So it's believed to be these guys uh, were kind of more apex predators in the habitat. They didn't have to compete with things like American lions and things as much as they did in North America. Much more open uh, species, while Fatalis was much more ha adapted to closed habitats, which is quite interesting. So in terms of diet, these guys, very similar uh, apex predators. So Smilodon and Popular Smilodon Populata lived in 
South America. These guys didn't eat as many horses and propositions and things like that as uh, the northern Fatalis. These guys would have fed a lot on Toxodons, um, uh, Cayman as well as evidence, lots of horses, uh, also lots of types of um, Macrochenia, things like that. So these guys would have eaten things like that. Much more South American species. Well, the uh, Amer Amer North American species would have fed a lot on like peccaries and llamas and things like that. And there was lots of overlap with the dire wolf and American lion for prey in Fatalis. So these guys would have been competing. But um, American lions, I don't believe, lived in the uh, South America. So it was basically them and just dire wolves dealing with them. But these guys obviously would have been scavengers as well. Uh, some of this predatory behavior believed to be for Smilodon, you know, these guys could have been quite good ambush predators and used their long uh, saber teeth to bite into their neck to deliver quite a fast kill. And they would have been, you can see, almost like more bear-like, so they were quite powerful and strong to hold down big prey. They were specifically adapted for eating large megafauna animals, uh, which is quite interesting. And there has been some debate to talk about whether how social they are. It's been a debate that's kind of gone on forever. So the most recent kind of evidence suggests that these guys uh, may have been either had some sort of family group going on. We don't know exactly what it means, uh, but they were not very... There was a lot of sexual dimorphism between them, uh, maybe a little bit. Uh, Mammals got to be a little bigger. But we do have injuries from Smilodon that uh, they wouldn't have been able to survive without the help of other Smilodon, so that is evidence they potentially live together. It's neither here nor there, it's not like a smoking gun, it's really hard to determine, but it's likely that these guys had some social life of some form, whether they were more like lions or like wolves or something in between or something completely different, we just don't really know, which is quite interesting. And there's actually been some studies looking to the development of how these guys grow. So there was a study looking that suggests that um, the Smilodons actually grew quite fast, quite similar to tigers, but there was a prolonged period of growth like seen in lions, so they were kind of like a mix of that. So they would have grown really fast like a tiger, but grown for a long time like a lion, so that allowed them to get quite big. And the clubs were quite reliant on their parents until the growth period ended, so very likely that uh, because of that, there's more evidence pushing to them potentially being social which is quite interesting. And as I mentioned, we do have all sorts of, because we have so much of Smilodon uh, fossils from La Brea Tar Pits and other Tar Pits in South America showing popular tar, these guys were very likely uh, social in that regard. They had injuries that they couldn't be able to hunt as all, all which is interesting. And, you know, you got a too small a tail for that. But yeah, as I mentioned, they lived during the Pleistocene. Uh, Smilodon popular tar would have lived in South America. And the reason that popular tire probably got much bigger than Fatalis is because they didn't have to deal with lots of other predators such as American lions and things like that. But yeah, popular tire was very successful with Homotherium never becoming that widespread in South America. And also they really only had to deal with terror birds and dire wolves. So these guys were able to much better take that large predator niche and able to attack and, you know, pr attack quite large prey. They kind of took that niche of the mega carnival and allowed them to get much bigger. And also being in open or open habitats compared to the ghost habitats of the northern Fatalis would have allowed them to attack more prey, which is, you know, attack larger prey and things like that, which is quite cool. So in terms of their extinction, is something that's always debated and talk about, of course, you know, with megafauna. So the same reason why, as I mentioned last episode, the step bison went extinct, probably a combination of human factors, you know, humans uh, hunting them, climate change or disease or a mixture of both. It's always going to be hotly debated. But the youngest uh, da direct date for Smilodon uh, Fatalis is actually quite different between Popular for thousands of years. So the latest... Uh, Fatalis date is uh, I believe to be about 13,000 years old and then for uh, popular tars about 10 to 11,000 years old so these guys may have actually lasted out a little bit longer uh, south than uh, as well but the most recent date for carbon 14 Fatalis is about 11,000 years ago though they're likely uncalibrated so they likely went extinct around the same time but these guys may have held out a little bit longer in the southern parts of South America and went extinct you know of course with the other big I say to make a fawn like the ground sauce and the mammoths and things like that. But yeah, this is a great mod. Nuto, I think, did a great job. And nice to cover a Smilodon popular tar, because this is a very interesting animal. You can see the difference in Fatalis. It's much bigger, much broader, longer face, things like that. But Fatalis is just a little bit more iconic, I think. And also we've got a melanistic skin as well. And we've got to look at these cute little cubs, as we mentioned the babies, you know, growing uh, 
as fast as tigers but as long as lions so these guys are very interesting uh, lots of evidence does point to them being social so very likely they would have been raised in potentially a wolf-like pack or something like that we don't have as much sexual dimorphism as extreme in, as lions so very likely they would have had something that was not very similar to lions in their uh, social structure but yeah really really cool and these guys are so cute love these little guys love seeing a baby uh smile it on really really cute so anyway i think this is a great place to end the video so i really 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 hope you guys enjoyed this video hope you guys like and subscribe always remember to get the little bell icon to get notified about anything so yeah for the guys enjoyed this video hope you guys like and subscribe and bye bye